All right. Hey, listen, we're having a lot of fun here with Mark Ambrose and Steve Shannon. I'm Les Carlson. You are the audience. It's Frontline Rewind. Let's rock. I want to hear Breakaway right now. Let's go for it. Breakaway. Idol Cure. Breakaway! Ow! I'm with uh, Mark Ambrose and Steve Shannon from Idle Cure. So, Mark, um, can you tell me a little bit about Breakaway and how that came about? You know, what was kind of interesting about Breakaway is um, the verses and the verses the chorus. I, I remember when we were recording this record, um, we hit a train wreck. Uh, Steve, if you remember, we were recording this, and then when it came down to the chorus, it was not working. Um, and we just hit a dead end and we said, this chorus is just not going to work. And so rather than can the song, um, you know, we kind of said, let's, let's have a little 24 hour respite. And so went home and (laughs) worked for about three hours trying to find a chorus that would work and came back the next day. And that was the course of breakaway was not even close to the chorus that we went in. Uh, to record the song with. So it was kind of funny that that ended up being our anthem. That ended up being our debut. 
uh, kind of the, the trademark signature song and sound of the band uh, when it was pretty much thrown together at the last minute in desperation. So, but that's how those things go, you know. So Breakaway was actually, was that the, the first, was that the demo? Come Alive was the demo. Come Alive was the demo. Breakaway is a song. Uh, it's a very interesting story. And I, Mark had just gotten his accounting degree from USC. Now he's got a wife and a child now. He and I have been playing together for eight years, and it's been fun, it's been nice, it's been grand, but you can understand that the necessity is, hey, you have a wife and a child now, you got this expensive degree from USC, time to go to work and quit playing music games, mm -hmm. right? So Mark had been writing, it's just in his nature to keep writing, and when the deal came through, Mark was right on that precipice of, should I stay or should I go, right? <laughs> and he had written Breakaway. I went time. over to his house, he was living in an apartment in Long Beach. And I was sitting out by the pool with him and he got his acoustic guitar and he showed me Breakaway. Just on acoustic guitar, just the right? Yeah. No lyrics. And I said, dude, that's great. That's our sound. That's it right there. That's what we've been looking for. It's that chunky arena rocky. I can hear it on electric guitars. And Mark, he's saying, well, and he wasn't sure. And later on, Mark said, I don't know if I want to participate on the album because it involves a commitment. They're going to want gigs. They're going to want tours. I need to blah, blah. And I said, then dude, give me Breakaway. Give me Breakaway to sing on a record. I'll give you full music royalties. You can come and you can pro-produce. Just give me that song. Uh -huh. I've got to have that song on a first record, whether you're there or not. And I, I really think that Mark... Just because Mark, like I told you, he's a piece of perfectionist. He doesn't just want to let somebody have at his song because he's hearing it in his head all the time, right? And that got Mark into the studio. And now the actual being in the studio and watching that process happen, which we all love. Very enticing. You know, you've been a touring guy for years and years and years. So mm -hmm. I'm sure the live show, for me, it's the studio, man. I yeah. love the studio. Well, yeah. I got I to gotta say I love the studio yeah. as well. And uh, how many years did you sing before you were in Idol Cure? I started singing with my first band in high school in 1969. And we started, and like I say, through the college years, we kind of fell apart, but I would keep singing. Influences were? Influences in those days were like you, the Beatles. Uh -huh. um, certainly the, the English Invasion bands. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, some of the early American bands were probably, you know, I, I started in college, I, I started playing, I had always played guitar. In fact, I played guitar before I sang. So, but in college, I got an acoustic guitar because you couldn't travel much with an amp back and forth to the right. dorm. So I started getting into things more like the Eagles and the acoustic stuff, Dan Fogelberg, and, and getting together with, say, trios that where we'd sing three-part harmonies, even Crosby, Stills, and Nash, that kind of stuff. Now, coming out, you know, I was in a secular band. The Lord was getting on my conscience about singing some of these secular songs, mm. and I wanted another outlet. And I had always wanted to do original material. So I started looking for some sort of outlet. Actually had met Chuck King, but uh, our musical tastes were always a little bit different from one another's. Mm. And then I met Mark Ambrose kind of by accident in the living room of his mom's house. Uh, he was sitting down at the piano. We did, uh, I think we did Joe Cocker, you know, and uh, just a little bit of Testa songs. And more important, hit it off immediately. Yeah. Just hit it off immediately. That he chemistry was, just was there. The chemistry. There and it's got to be there. Yeah. You know? It does. I mean, you can, you can try to make it work with other people. Sometimes it can work just on the music alone, you know? And, you know, we've known so many bands that, oh, man, they're great on stage, but they hate each other's guts the moment they get off stage. Right? Yeah. There's a few of those secular bands like that. Yeah. And a couple Christian and bands. And a couple Christian Maybe bands. Maybe two. Yeah. Total. So we got along great together, you know, there again, sat down for maybe three songs at the piano and then spent a couple hours just having a great time talking. Mark was playing in, um, I, you probably have to call it a, you know, a fusion kind of band, right? No lead singer, so they were just getting together musically and playing. Started singing with them, nobody had written any lyrics yet, had to write some lyrics, and then that, that's just kind of how it developed, right? And in the early days, Chuck was kind of in and out of different bands. Um, there's a, 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 you probably never heard of a band called Eden, but Eden recorded a song on Maranatha called Break Out of the Night that did very well. And Actually, I sang the lead vocals on I that. think I have heard of yeah. those guys. Yeah. So that was the first time I was in the studio singing Break Out of the Night for Eden, which Chuck King and Roger were in. And they, their lead singer just wasn't cutting it. So they called me in the middle of the night. Dude, we're in the studio. We got to finish this song. Can you come help us out? So I went in and sang that song. And so 
And then, so later on, it just develops. Mark and I are playing in Sojourn. And then the last song Mark wrote for Sojourn was Come Alive. We had met Bill Baumgart, and Bill Baumgart said, look, you guys, I'll make you a deal. I'm gonna, I'll cut you guys a demo in my home studio, free of charge, but the deal is if you get a record deal, I get to be the producer. And that's exactly what we did. Jim Kempner heard Come Alive and a couple other songs, signed us, and that's basically how things started. Didn't have a name for the band, so, we, so Frontline did a national name search, and the songs were doing so well on the radio, we had Breakaway that was hitting the charts. Um, well, no, no, it was, this was before. They said, we got a band, it's hard rock, it's along the lines of such and such, what should the name be? And we got like 1,200 entries. And there were, <laughs> there were names like uh, 80 Pound Face and Hitler Brothers, and you know, <laughs> they went from amusing to kind of overbearing, you know, stuff. And so, but we saw Idle Cure. And for some reason, and what we did is, you know, each of us individually wrote down, say, our 10 favorite, and that was the one name that occurred on everybody's ballot. Ah. And then, of course, we got, well, what's it mean? What's it mean? What's it mean? And that's why we liked it, because it didn't really mean anything, but at the same time, you could read into it. Because the one thing that we were talking about earlier, at the time, the one thing that bothered me was the over-the-top Christian lyrics. It wasn't that so much you wanted to be a crossover band, because that, that could be a cop-out, right? And there were a lot of bands trying that, and they, they were kind of falling shy of the mark spiritually. But on the other hand, you know, we wanted to do lyrics that were a little bit more insightful, that touched on really intense issues, that it's okay to be a Christian and write a song about abortion, yeah. right? It's okay to, Mark will tell you about Mind Games. Mind Games is a, is a song about Christians that are into porn, and, and it happens because we're all afflicted with the same sins. Mm -hmm. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to approach lyrical content on a, on a practical level mm -hmm. as well. Where people could say, you know, I have this, yeah, I struggle with this. And Absolutely. I can, I can still love Jesus and he can love me. Absolutely. And, and let's thing, face yeah. it, Les, in the early days, when you were playing in, say, the mid-late 80s as a Christian rock band, you could go into the Deep South and play for a Southern Baptist and there'd be people outside with pickets oh, saying absolutely. devil's music, right? Uh -huh. and, and who you were singing to was not them. You were singing to the disenfranchised youth with long hair right. that said, man, they won't let us in the pews because we're not fit to be a Christian and they hate the music we listen to. Yeah. And that was the audience because you wanted to say, that's what Jesus and went among those people. Hundreds. Hundreds. Of, thousands of kids yeah. got saved through yeah. all of our ministries yeah. from Frontline. Yeah, that, you know, Come Alive was probably the, the ultimate in desperation. Um, Steve, you'll remember this. When we were in Arizona, uh, we had, I can't even remember how long the set was, probably a 40-minute set. Uh, but the desperation was we had no more songs. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're done, and we figure it's time to leave, and we get a standing ovation, and they start chanting for more. Uh, well, uh, we have an option at that point. Do we redo another song? Um, or what? And so the what is what we picked. All I had was the beginning intro of Come Alive, which is just kind of this guitar signature th part. And I, I told Steve, I said, you know, I'll just go out and start playing this thing and let's see what happens. And so we literally started, the, 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 if you've heard Come Alive, then you know that the signature intro, we played that for five minutes. <laughs> just kept repeating it. And all Steve did was do these, ooh, yeah, ooh, yeah, come alive. <laughs> and that was it, but it worked. And it got through five minutes. And uh, when we got off, we said, what was that? And so it was funny that that was the only carryover that remained and actually became the first song of Idle Cure. So another classic illustration of desperation, kind of how the Lord works actually <laughs> <laughs> in life. <laughs>
All the music you hear on Frontline Rewind episodes is available on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and our own website, frontlinerecords.us. Once Mark got um, sort of drawn into it. Drawn into it. I'll give you another example. And there again, I I feel guilty talking about Mark's songs, but Come Back to Me is another perfect example. Mark in Sojourn was a keyboard player. He played keyboards. Mm -hmm. We had Chuck play guitar for a while. We had another guy play, Ed Evans, play guitar for a while. So Mark was writing music on keyboards, and all everything was on keyboards. So he plays guitar and keys. He plays guitar and keys. Yeah. And when I met him, even though he worked at a guitar shop, um, he he sold his vintage Les Paul to get a you know a great <laughs> keyboard, right? Which I think now he regrets. <laughs> yeah. But so come back to me. He's written on keyboard, uh-huh. and I always really really liked that song. And we just thought, well, Idle Cure is going to be a more guitar driven band. Mark's playing guitar now probably not suited for the first album. Well, Mark rewrites it on guitar mm. and puts in that lank, dink, lank, you know, that kind of lopey guitar part and everything that completely changed the, the mood of the song, mm-hmm. made it more poppy, you know, made it, in fact, when it was released, it, it's the one that hit the alternative stations, right? And it was just, to me, an example of how versatile Mark was, that he could take a song he had written on keys and then transpose it. Now he writes it on guitar. It's got a whole new feel. The kind of neat thing about it was, is I had sung it on keyboards. I had sung it really poppy. So now that it's on guitars, you thought, well, we better make it more rocky. And Mark says, no, 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 dude, keep it poppy. I want the the the, the Daryl Hall kind of, you know, mm-hmm. that that poppy mm-hmm. sort of feel to yeah. it. So we kept it like that, which is harder for me than singing the the hard edge stuff. But we did it, and I was very pleased with how it turned yeah. out. It feels good when you do that, though, as a singer, to do Absolutely. something that's just a little bit different, and you kind of get it inspired. I love being by out of my it. comfort zone. And yeah. again, being in the studio yep. is is it's a wonderful. It's like a, you, you become that the character. The song dictates a it's character. It's so true. Yeah, and you're almost an actor at yep. that point. It's so you, true. Yeah, yeah. Because and, you know and, we're a lot alike. You know? Absolutely. And and every line you kind of the interpreter. It's almost like an actor that the more you get into a role, yeah. you, Oh, now I understand the character. Yes. And for me, it's, it's like singing a song because you demo a song and I never wanted to make a song on a record sound like a demo. To me, a song's an evolution and it's got to grow as it goes on. So by the time you get to the studio, you should have learned more about what's expected to you as a lead singer in that song. Yeah. And, and so it, sometimes it altogether changes. Yeah. Um, you got to hold things loosely. Uh, when you go in, you, you go in with uh, an idea, you go in with a skeleton, but things take shape depending on who's listening and the influence they have. And so if you're, you know, working with a producer that, you know, presents an idea or and his idea can even spurn a different idea. Uh, so a big part, in my opinion, of going in the studio is not just executing recording, but keeping the creative process going. So uh, you're open to things um, growing and maturing and, and taking shape and usually very different than how you go in. Sometimes they're the same. Sometimes they're spot on. You hit it on the, in the beginning, but other times they, they take uh, on a life of their own, which is usually a better life because you have more influence, more opinions and more gift sets coming together. So come back to me. Come back to me. Idle cure them.
Speaking of our debut record, uh, we are really excited um, that uh, six months ago we get contacted um, that I guess a Benson rep uh, who had passed away. And our first record um, was distributed, uh, recorded at Frontline, distributed by Benson. And uh, it was actually a vinyl and back in the day. CD was, was just hitting, but before that uh, it was, you know, the old, the old uh, 33. And so we got contacted. This Benson rep had passed away, and they found in his estate he had a box of unopened debut Idol Cure albums, uh, all still sealed, original. And uh, this is going back 30 years. Um, and so we were really excited, and they asked us if, if we wanted them, and so we bought them. And so what we're doing is making them available to anybody that wants them out there, any of the fans, anybody that uh, is interested in more of a collector's item. Obviously, if you just want to hear the record, you can get on iTunes and download it. But if you're interested in actually having a, a record, um, the first record of Vital Cure, as well as it's in perfect condition, still sealed, and probably even recommend you keep it that way, um, we would love to provide that for you. And so we're offering that along with a bio and a photo. And you can get all the details on our Facebook page, Idol Cure Music on Facebook. And there's a bunch of different ways we can get it to you. You can pay, pay for it with PayPal, et cetera. But all the details are there on our Facebook page. So hopefully you'll check it out. But yeah, we're really excited. There are a few left, uh, not a ton, limited edition, obviously. Uh, we don't even have these. So we're really grateful that we would get our hands on some. Shh. Silent hope. <laughs> can you tell me about that? So. Uh, Silent Hope started with a Chuck riff on guitar. Uh, Chuck was great at guitar riffs. Brought it to me and kind of sat in limbo. Gave it to Pete. Pete was doing around on keyboards. Pete had come up with the, with that little that little interesting keyboard part uh -huh. that kind of changed it all once again. Changed the mood of it all together. Uh -huh. And now all of a sudden with that, I kind of got shifted into gear and I thought, oh wow. This has got to be more of a kind of esoteric thing. And I love that sort of thing, right? So you know how memories call back to you, right? And I used to attend way back. I was like 12. I had this lady who was watching me because I was a latchkey kid. My parents both worked, right? And she would, in my words, then drag me to church practically all day Sunday, right? And a lot of times while she was with the church group, I'd be outside. And it was a church in downtown Los Angeles, right by the, the library. So, I mean, the hard part of town. And I'd be outside and you'd see these like street people walking around. I was really, really young. And, and one of the things that I always remembered was there was this neon sign hanging that said, Jesus saves, right? And at night, it, was, it would illuminate and it would seem to light up the whole block. And I always had that picture in my mind, uh -huh. neon light that says, Jesus saves, right? And so while you would be looking around, and you'd see, like I say, these street people, and you could tell people that were alcoholics or maybe on drugs or maybe even street walkers, that kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's this neon message, Jesus saves. So I said, I want to write a song about desperation. I want to write a song about people addicted to drugs, people that are hopeless, mm -hmm. people that have nothing to live for, but there's this reminder that Jesus saves. So that's what inspired Silent Hope. I started writing this song within the back of my mind, Neon Message, Jesus Saves, and wrote it and kind of built it around that. But with even though these people are living lives of deparation, as they see this neon message, they have this silent hope that yeah. they can be saved from this life of yeah. desperation. Yeah. And it's so true. And they can be. And they can be. And they have been. So many of them. Uh, largely uh, due to efforts like people like you and that have written songs and inspired people to be drawn to God. It's, it's cool. Frontline had a lot of, a lot of groups like that. They really did. And I, I, I always thought the label was appropriately named because while there were Christian labels sort of playing it safe, sort of playing it to the mainstream mm -hmm. of those days, Frontline wanted cutting edge artists. They really did yeah. want to be on the front line. And that's, that's Jimmy's heart for ministry. Yes, it is. And his love for Jesus. Yes, so, it is. Yeah. And still is. And still is, yeah. He's a, he's a pastor still. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. And now for your listening pleasure, Silent Hope. I'm 
another blackout in the city Another promise laid away Streets are beckoning the cries of pity You've grown accustomed to the day It's an amazing story, and I like that, that you, you reach back in an experience and wrote the lyrics to that. One of my favorite things yeah. to be able to do, and you don't, it's interesting how songs happen. Um, so many faces. Pete and Mark had written out a piece of music. Uh, Pete had written this descending keyboard scale. And Mark had put on this kind of chunky guitar. But it was a rush because we had just come out. This is from the second album. Mm -hmm. We'd just come out with the front album, the first album. Tough Love. Tough, this is Tough Love. Yeah. Okay. Chuck King had just left the band. Hence the title, which I came up with, Tough Love. Because those days, it, that's exactly what it was. We were having to sacrifice, having to be without something we were accustomed to. Chuck and I had been friends. Uh, Chuck's wife was Kelly's best friend in high school, right? And yet... I thought, I always looked upon that as, uh, the Lord has just broken a loaf of bread, made two, and now is feeding more people. Uh -huh. right? yeah. So that was kind of my attitude about that. No hard feelings, but at the same time, it was tough. We were having to regrow, learn to reassess things, write songs from a different perspective, right? And then all of a sudden it's, you guys, they need you in Europe. 
They're calling. You, you guys need to go because your mm -hmm. album's going bananas. Breakaways being played on secular stations, for goodness sakes. You got to go. So we packed up and we went. And Mark and I had always thought, oh, the neat thing about going on a big, long plane ride is what a great opportunity to write lyrics. Oh, so I love to write on airplanes. I was pressing and pressing and pressing and pressing. I go, I have this great piece of music. Oh, it's so good. But I just, I just need a starting point, need a starting point. So we land in Amsterdam, right? I've got horrendous jet lag. I'm just wired beyond belief. It's two in the morning. And you know Amsterdam. It's two in the morning, but outside it looks like dusk. <laughs> and the streets are full of people. Right? Yeah. So They're I'm just standing up started. there in this little tiny room that Youth with a Mission had kind of put you up in, right? And it's kind of still inside, and it's, it's a dead of winter outside. It's maybe all of 18 degrees, right? And I'm looking up and going, I'm in Amsterdam, and I'm sitting in a room. This just isn't going to work. So I got into my suitcase, pull out every piece of clothing I could find against the cold, right? Go outside, and as you open the door, <sighs> right? And I turn around, and I close the door, and all of a sudden, these words just kind of emanate. I close the door to feel the cold gray pulse of the night. And I thought, ooh, that's cool. I like that. And then as I thought about that, and I'm walking, I'm going, that even works against Pete's descending keyboard thing, unless that's a song that literally wrote itself in my head. Ah. Beautiful. As I took that walk through the red light district of Amsterdam, mm -hmm. no less, right? I've been there, uh, not as a customer. <laughs> and then where by the, by, the, by the second verse, I'm going, I gotta remember this. This is good stuff, right? And that, that's what I love too. Songs that just write themselves, you know. Yeah. Like you said, I prayed first. I said, Lord, I'm, I'm a stranger in a strange land. I'm going through the red light district. Uh, I might come out a better man. I might come out dead. I mean, you know, you just don't know. So you, you pray for protection. You pray for inspiration. Amsterdam's an incredibly inspiring place. It's an amazing mm -hmm. city, one of my yes. very favorites. Yes, it is. And, and like I said, that song literally just assembled itself over time to where when I got back to the room, I'm just furiously scribbling stuff down. Just pouring out of you. Just poured out. Yeah. So one of my favorite songwriting experiences. So many faces.
Be sure to check out Frontline Records YouTube channel for exclusive live performances recorded right here on our Frontline Rewind shows. You guys, um, it's funny that you had as much success as you did and you really weren't really striving for it that much. You were no. really focused on your families. Um, you had a real good, I think a real intelligent approach to what was going on in your lives. A lot of us rockers, you know, well, we just are rockers. But you you and Mark are career type guys. Are you a lawyer? Is that? No, no. Oh, you I, were in law I, school? I, I went to law school that I got married and had a child that, and that has a way of putting a crimp on your plans so in law school. that changes some things. But I'll, I'll tell you what, it was more than that. Um, I got into law school and for my first year I was really doing well. Made the law review in fact. But less I would look at the people around me and say, I don't like who these people are or who they're becoming. Yeah. And I would love to think it was Pepperdine University and they even had a Christian Lawyers Association, right? But I thought, I don't know if, if I can keep my moral compass uh -huh. and go down this road. Because I mean, that it, the path is just strewn with people who have abandoned that morality in that yeah. field. And, and it became very cutthroat. I was in law school at a time where in California, less than half of the people who graduated law school were passing the bar. So it would be four years of law school, then take the bar. Oh, and by the way, you've got a wife and a kid to raise. So, you know, so it just became so far-fetched. Mm. And then I'm going to also say that, that the music had a, a big hand to play in that. Uh -huh. Yeah. That as I found I could work a job and do the music, which it's always been the case for me. I've never been able to completely dedicate to music. And people have said, gosh, Steve, what could have happened had you done that? And I said, well, you know, it might have been a different kind of path, but mm -hmm. I don't know, it worked out pretty well. Like you say, Mark and I would always sit down and we would say, okay, look, let's say we leave our jobs. And we all had very good jobs. Yeah. But let's say we leave our jobs. And we put that much added pressure on the necessity to have to make music yeah. all the time. And then it becomes not something that we love. It doesn't yeah. become an avocation when you make it a vocation. And, and that's the point I was trying to make is that you were sort of, you, you weren't obsessed with making it. So you're sort of indifferent. And in sales, being indifferent really makes the sale. I think so. You know? I think so. And here you are having this success, and it's kind of like, well, wow, aren't you excited? And you, yeah, we're excited, and it's great, but it's not like, you know. So, I, so the success just kept coming. And your music is awesome. I mean, you listen to it, you like it right away. It's well, we could have. You know, with our attitude... And with the, the limited, in the early days, they would tease us at Frontline, oh, you guys are the steely Dan of the Christian industry. All you, know, all you want to do is in the studio, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, it was the radio airplay that worked so good of on course. our behalf. Because when we showed up someplace, the introduction was made, right? I mean, Breakaway was a huge success. Takeaway was an enormous success on the AC stations, for goodness sake, right? And in other songs like Come Back to Me would hit. So, I mean, we got a widespread sort of radio audience. Mm -hmm. Pete and I would have to go in on, we'd have to take a day off and literally go in for a 10 hour day at Frontline and do 20, 25 interview, radio interviews a day mm -hmm. because there were just stations looking for interviews. And that's how you can feed your ministry. Yeah. You don't have to fly to Nashville. I mean, you can go into a, you know, and do an interview yeah. at, from the Frontline offices all these different radio stations, Mike McLean would set them up beautifully, and that's what we would do. So you would feed the momentum without having to necessarily go out and play live. Yeah, and now we've got Frontline Rewind. That's right. Just playing your stuff in 2016. That's right, bringing it all back to life. Thank you, Praise Adele. the Lord. You are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting story. We, uh, we went to, uh, I went with Brian and Ken Tamplin and... Uh, and uh, a few other artists, right, and everything. We went to Nashville because it was the the, the big show, GMA. the GMA. Oh, yeah. The and Dove so Awards. Brian would, yes. Brian would explain, oh, no, no, it's not much and everything. Oh, but Steve, uh, tomorrow morning, they'd like you to get up and, and do an interview. It was at like 9 in the morning, right? That's early. And so Brian just picked me up. It wasn't the other guys. And we're driving there. I said, well, Brian, how come the other guys aren't here? Well, they want to do it with you and everything. And actually, Steve, I got kind of an interesting request. Um, a few of the guys think that you're not maybe not singing on Take It. And I said, what? What? And I said, well, I mean, everybody knows your rock and roll voice. And Take It is just way too mellow of a song. 
and they noticed that Bill Baumgart wrote it, and it's just, it seems really, really out of your comfort zone, and they'd like to hear you sing it live, right? So they literally had it set up, no vocals, put me on a chair in the middle of a big table with about 20 radio and Benson exec uh, guys sitting okay, around. Okay, talk about being on the spot. Handed me a mic and said, okay, now sing, take it. And Terry from... Um, Terry Taylor. Terry Taylor, right? Who's uh -huh. the funniest guy I ever met. Yes, right? he is funny. And he was saying, oh, dude, you're in for it now, man. Nine in the morning, good luck, right? Because he knew about Take It and everything. And, and way out of my comfort zone to sing that, right? Bill probably took 20% of the recording time just getting me perfect on Take It because it was his baby, right? <laughs> so I sat there and I'm going, and I, and I only found out on the way and I'm going, oh, for heaven's sakes. So I get up and did it, and I'm not sure. You kind of lose yourself in a performance, so yeah, it's probably sure. oh, decent, you know. And we got back, and Terry kind of high-fives me. He says, dude, you nailed it. Good job. Right? There you go. But it just goes to show, man. I mean, and, But I guess that's the nature of the beast. You're sort of always having to prove yourself, and like we were talking about, being out of your comfort zone helps yeah. you grow. Yeah. And then it was a good thing. Yeah. In those days, we rarely even did take it live. Because we found out that when we got live, people wanted the rock stuff. Break away, you know, come uh -huh. on, right? So, I mean, we did take it at Knott's Berry Farm, but that might have been the only time we performed it live. Quietly in your heart alone Lies a feeling that you've never known Hidden by all the pain that's there inside of you And yet this feeling still shines through Don't let 
onlinerecords.us, we have all kinds of goodies. Artist bios, links to all the music, and a free music offering when you sign up for the newsletter. Check it out, frontlinerecords.us. You know, you know, there's one story, Steve, and I, I know you'll remember this. This was like um, one of those times you'll never forget. Uh, we were in Paris, and we had to get on a train to get to probably Munich. So it was a good little train ride away. And we were late. And when we got to Paris train station, we had to get in line. I don't know if you remember, Steve, but we, the line was really long. And we thought, we're never going to make this train. And so I tried to crowd. <laughs> I went to the front of the line and, you know, said, hey, can I sneak in? Where, you know, and, and nobody, you know, parlez-vous anglais? No, 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 no. Yeah, oh, it's not possible. It's not possible. <laughs> and so I told the lady, I said, you know, we need eight train tickets because, you know, we had road crew and that kind of thing. And, oh, it's not possible. And you have to get to the back of the line. And so I don't know if you remember, but we went over in the corner and, um, and we prayed. And it, by all stretch, it was not, we're not going to make this this train ride. So we're going to miss the gig. I mean, so this was a big deal. Promoter, all that stuff. And, um, and so we prayed. And as we were praying, I just sensed a person standing not too far away from us. And um, so I opened my eyes while somebody was praying. And it was a guy off in the corner. And he kind of raised his eyebrows and looked at me and kind of just like, like I should know him. And so I looked at him and he looked at me and he kind of fingered me over, like, come over here. And uh, uh, so I broke from the group and um, I went over there and he had broken English and he said, how can I help you? And I said, well, we're looking for train tickets. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out eight train tickets. Do you remember that? Yes. And I said we could use those. And they were to Munich. And I said, uh, how much do I owe you? And he says, nothing. They're yours. I'm like blown away because we're in a hurry too. So I ran back to the group. Guys, you won't believe it. This guy right over here. And I pointed behind me and he was gone. gone. Remember that? Yes. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, <laughs> that's probably the time I saw an angel. That, that's probably the only time I saw an angel. But uh, that was pretty dang remarkable. And I'm not one of those guys that, you know, goes, oh, okay, there's an angel on, around every corner or under every rock or whatever. But that, that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing instance. And God certainly pulled through. And we made the date, and it was a great gig. And so it all worked out. But that was uh, one, of those, one of those times I'll never forget. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. It was a great, great time. I hope you enjoyed the show. I know I really did. So... Be ready to get into part two when it comes out. Um, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Mark. It's Les Carlson here. Until next time, with Idle Cure, part two. Mm-hmm.